so you are in writing better jQuery infused JavaScript. My name is Ken Dale. You can find me on all the various interwebs places at Ken Dale IV. If you're wondering what the IV is for, I have a suffix on my name that's a four. So it's kind of crazy. There's three others before me. So we'll take a few cheap shots at jQuery to get started because why not? So who's heard of jQuery? <laughs> so just keep your hands up. Now who's heard of JavaScript? I should see no hands go down. <laughs> Fair enough. That, that, that pleases me because, you know, there is the notion, it's like, oh, I'm a jQuery developer, what's JavaScript? Like, no. <laughs> so get some little afternoon humor here going. So when is use jQuery not a valid answer to a JavaScript <laughs> question? So you, I'm sure you've seen the, the Stack Overflow joke where it's, you know, add a number to another number, but we're going to scroll beyond that one and we're going to go to this little deeper humor. When you're trying to reboot the system to get the electric fences back on. <laughs> Seriously, even jQuery knows better than to shut down the Raptor fences. <laughs> There's also, you might not need jQuery.com. So rather than doing this lovely little get JSON call here, you can do that. <laughs> okay, some of, uh, in fairness, some of these are nicer than others. Some are a little more verbose. Obligatory Doge humor, such, very jQuery, such JS, wow. Okay, moving on. And how to use jQuery without making a mess? Of course, this is Stack Overflow, so the question was A, closed, B, it was downvoted, and because of my rep, we can see that an error occurred during vote count fetch. Um, and I have no internet. Okay, goodbye, everyone. It's been, I'm going to tether here quick. And I have zero bars on my phone, so this is going to go very well. Also, where I can, why can I not get to my lovely little taskbar thing? Identifying. Oh, I'm connected on my phone. All right. Tethering is great. So somebody upvoted it, but it got three down votes. But I guess nobody's really interested in the answer. I mean, you all clearly are, but on Stack Overflow, this question is getting no love. That said, we'll, we'll get right into the talk here. So the goal of today's talk is to be able to take the code example you see before you and be able to make it better. I'll give you a minute just to kind of digest the code, then I'll show you it, the code in action so you kind of get an idea. If you don't understand it, we'll walk through it, so not a problem. So you've probably had enough time. So let's see a live working example of this thing. I have a very simple web page here. There's the source, just to prove it actually is the same thing. And it's a very simple application where you put a stock symbol here. It's already pre-populated with a stock symbol for Microsoft. And there's a fetch button you can probably imagine what's going to happen when I click on the fetch button. So we're going to go ahead and do that. It grabbed the latest stock price from Yahoo Finance and put it on the page. So it added it to the current as well as it added it to the history. So the current always gets completely paved over every time, whereas the history keeps a kind of a running log. So it's a simple application example. If we change Microsoft to Google's stock ticker symbol here, we can see that Google's trading for a lot more than Microsoft. <laughs> That's all the comment I'm going to provide on that matter. And just to prove a point, we'll also call Microsoft again. So the last time I called Microsoft's stock symbol, yeah, stock ticker symbol up, it was 4515. Who here thinks it went up? This is a show of hands. Not, not very optimistic people. Who thinks it went down? Who thinks it went the same or d had no change? I'm going to guess it changed, and I'm going to say positive. 40, oh, it's exactly the same. So we could continue calling it over and over again. 
enough that Yahoo Finance may or may not get angry at us for pounding on their service. Now that you've kind of seen what the application looks like, we can kind of walk through some of the code and start to digest it. So if you are familiar with jQuery, usually when you see a dollar sign in client-side code, it's generally referring to jQuery. It's kind of just a known paradigm of client-side programming, at least with JavaScript. So it calls the document ready, so whenever everything's ready to go, when the docu document object model, aka the browser, when everything's already prepared, wire something up to the fetch button, so whenever you click on the fetch button, it will pull out the stock symbol that was put in to that text box, and it will get the value from it to uppercase it and trim it, so in case I had like a trailing space or something crazy in there, we'd you know, normalize it and unify everything. Then it makes the call to Yahoo Finance, which I've omitted the URL and designated as some long URL here. And before it sends, which you may or may not have seen, it happens pretty quickly, but it does display this loading dialog. And then when it comes back, it needs to parse the XML response, which yes, it returns XML and not JSON, which actually is kind of cool for this talk because it makes things a little more interesting. You gotta take that extra step to parse what you want out of the XML. Then after that, it updates the UI. So these two lines here are doing the UI updating. Cool stuff. So there's a lot of power in this code when you think about it. We have a completely working application and the entire code for the application is all visible on the screen. And for a simple example like this, this might be the best way to do things, but it's just not scalable. If this turned into a thousand lines and you kind of went down the same road, you're going to end up with a world of hurt. You're going to have that 1,000 or 2,000 line jQuery JavaScript file that's just an absolute maintainable, yeah, maintainability nightmare. I mean, has anybody you know had that experience where you're absolutely terrified to change anything in the file because you never know what's going to happen. It's like you think you're only changing this one little thing, but you fixed one bug and you broke like 11 other things. You know, if you've seen that, the grumpy cat image where 99 bugs on the wall, you take one down, fix it around, you've got like 108 or some <laughs> odd number. You really should have included that image. But... Part of the problem here and what this talk aims to address is the mixed concerns of what's happening here. So if we were to color code some of the different sections, which I haven't actually done, so just kind of visualize with your mind the color coding, that we have things like accessing the DOM, we have things like wiring things up, we've got this parsing code, we've got you know, accessing the DOM again, We've got parsing code, we've got this jQuery Ajax. It's like every other line or every few lines, we're kind of switching gears, we're switching contexts, we're totally changing what we're doing. And that makes things really difficult to break it apart and it makes it really difficult to test and reason about over time. And for this simple example, this is great and amazing, but you don't use thousand line samples in talks. So that's why this is pretty small and trim here. So kind of getting into the why, like why do we want to do this? I mean, I've kind of addressed some of the maintainability, but if you want to write automated tests, good luck. I mean, yeah, you might be able to do it, but it's going to be so painful. And whenever you find yourself writing automated tests, you find you have to break your code down in nice orderly chunks or things are just going to spin completely out of control. And I'm assuming a lot of us in the room are professional developers. We like to do good work. We don't like having the switch statement that has a thousand different case things because control C, control V was easy. And at the end of the day, like, we wanna feel good about our work and that's kind of where the, the warm fuzzies come into play. That we wanna do things and we wanna do things right. We wanna do things methodical, modular, test them feel really good at the end of the day that what we're doing is providing value and is not going to break and the next person who potentially takes over your project if they're a you know, bad person they're not going to come to your home and you know, look for you for the, the code that you've left behind as your, your legacy. 
So quick jQuery things or just JavaScript things in general, move your JavaScript to external files. If you recall, I had a script block that had everything in there. There's probably 101 reasons why you should do this. I'll give you maybe two of them. So normally, whenever you're downloading that page, you download this big blob of HTML content. If your script is part of that page, that means you're downloading your JavaScript, which is probably not changing page, page load to page load. You're downloading that entire payload every time, which may or may not be a big deal if you're on a high-speed internet connection with a desktop browser. But if you've got your mobile phone out and you're paying T-Mobile for every gig you're transferring, that's no fun. Plus, it takes a little bit longer. And the web today is moving also to this notion of HTTPS and you know we've got this HTTP strict transport security and we've got all of these different security models. One of them is content security policy. By default with content security policy, if you implement it, it does not allow inline scripts that are unsafe to take place. You can ex explicitly allow it, but nobody wants to get into that whole notion of even having to think about that. So. There's probably 99 other reasons why you should do this. It's just something you should be doing. And strict modes. This is where I get to play around in the Chrome console and hopefully I don't completely fail. So strict mode essentially is aiming to turn things that normally would be developer errors into actual compiler errors. So if we create a variable named A, here inside our function. This will more than happily create a global variable A, which you can access, we get test back. So that's kind of scary. We just created a global variable and we did it completely by accident by virtue of simply forgetting the var keyword. But if we rerun the same block of code with our lovely use strict directive and I'll change it to B, now whenever I hit enter, we're gonna get an error. So B is not defined. So essentially use strict is converting things that normally would be you know, bad behavior or things you don't intend to happen, kind of converts them into errors. And if you're using Babel or any of those cool transpilers, I think Babel at least, I think it automatically pumps this into your JavaScript. So they're on board, you might as well get on board too. And yeah. So if you're wondering what I was doing before, I thought this was an important concept, so I figured I'd address it. What I was just doing in the Chrome console, if you're wondering what all those crazy parens are about, I'm basically wrapping my code in an immediately invoked function expression, which some people call it an iffy. So if you ever hear that kind of talked about, it's, they're not just being iffy, it's this. So how this works, if you break it down into its components, we have a standard JavaScript function, which is an anonymous function because it doesn't have a name. We wrap that in parens, making it a function expression. And then how do you execute a function in JavaScript? Well, you call it with the parens. So we have the parens added after that. I thought it was an important concept to address if you're just getting into client-side development that you, know, you usually want to wrap your code in one of these to kind of isolate yourself from just from others isolate yourself from tampering, because JavaScript, you know, the this keyword and the whole function scope, things can get out of control, but if you start putting your code inside these, things get back to the, the realm of sanity at least a little more, but ES6 makes a lot of this kind of a moot point. But. And jQuery offers all sorts of great shorthand, so I did document ready. In a lot of code, you'll see this written as just dollar and then function good times. And this is the last like oh my gosh will he just get on with that slide. So rather than using click I like to use on and then the event which it may not seem like a big deal now but whenever we get to the testing portion you'll kind of see why I choose to do it this way. And part of the power of doing it this way is if we wanted to change click into a right click there's no top level right click that I'm aware of. So you can't just change the click here to a right click, but you can more than happily change the click here to a right click. So always use the on when you wire stuff up. And there's also the success callback in jQuery Ajax. 
I don't want to get too down into the, the, the promises, the, the, the land of promises and whatnot, but instead of doing jQuery success here, you can lean into the promises pattern and just do the dot done on that, which will enable you to have some better testing scenarios and make your life a little bit easier. But essentially, these two lines can be thought of as equivalent. And general good programming practice, don't use deprecated things. jQuery Live was deprecated, stop using it. There's a, there's a really easy workaround if you do need to do the same kind of thing, which is available on the jQuery site. All right, so now that we got the, the softballs out of the way, we'll move into the, the, the actual meat of the talk. Whenever I flip the slide, don't freak out. That's, that's, that's your only goal for the next five seconds. Okay, so we have, we have one, <laughs> one, okay. So, unmixing the concerns. So I was talking before about this whole notion that we have code that updates the UI and does this and does parsing and all of those things are constantly changing, they're all intermixed. We wanna start pulling those out into their own separate modules to be able to think about and reason about them completely separately. So what does that look like? So it moves from this jQuery Ajax done here on the top. We follow all the patterns and good practices and if you're familiar with it, I'm using the namespace module pattern or whatever you want to call that thing. There's all sorts of ways to do this. I chose to use this one for this talk. But essentially, I'm taking everything that's happening here in this really commonly sought out, you know, just jQuery, Ajax, call, done, put, put your code in it. I'm moving all of that into this notion of a data provider and then I have a method on the data provider called get prices. So we took all of this code and we essentially gave it an actual name of data provider get prices. And then all of the code here is the same code that is up here. So we basically just created this whole idea of this global stock retriever which houses all of my things and the first thing I created on that was the data provider. So then the usage of it rather than using it like this thing here at the top that essentially has no meaning of its own, it doesn't describe itself, now it starts to have some of those qualities. So to actually use it, we would call stock retriever, data provider, get prices, and we pass in the stock ticker symbol, which we would have captured from our UI with the user typing in that text box. In this case, they typed in the Microsoft stock ticker symbol. Then they can call the dot done and put the code here. So the code here is the same code that would be, you know, or whatever, not here, but whatever code you want to take place after the price actually comes back. So it's like everything gets encapsulated with regards to data retrieval into this get prices method. And we can sit here all day and I can show you painstakingly how to do this, but Basically, you want to look at your application and think about all of the different things that it does. So in a lot of web applications, you'll probably have something like a UI provider, maybe a data provider, maybe I'd even want to split it out because my data provider, in my example, is actually doing XML parsing. So if your application was big enough, maybe that would even be its own separate thing that you'd want to test independently. So basically, just look at the Look at what you've got and try to just pull the pieces apart and separate everything out into its own methodical thing. And one final note before we get onto the testing portion, having a single obvious way to start the app. So before we had the very first slide, we have that big code block and it just kind of runs. But now after we've got everything separated out, we need some obvious way to instrument the thing to actually have it work. Without this line, nothing actually happens. So it would render the page with the text box and a button that essentially do nothing. And having this single obvious entry point, it just makes things really easy to think about and reason about now that you have everything broken down into components. So testing. So I've kind of covered the whole notion of pulling things apart 
And at the same time, you can also write some really cool automated tests to go along with those sorts of things. So I come from, I actually write a lot of C Sharp and a lot of .NET code, which is interesting because I find the power of Jasmine and just this whole notion of being able to do whatever you want with JavaScript testing, it's really powerful because we're writing tests, but we don't have a lot of this like compiler goo. We're not decorating things with these fact attributes. We don't need public void or public task as or public async task. We don't have all of this stuff. It's just we're describing what we want to take place. So in this case, I'm just doing a simple smoke test that it should pass a simple test where I expect true to be true. If this ever fails, you should probably just take your laptop and just throw it in a lake. Because <laughs> I don't even know what's going on anymore. But more seriously, maybe something's broken with the library. I mean, there might be an actual reason for the failure, but yeah, this you should never expect this to fail. And if this is kind of your first run at testing or you're setting up testing for the first time in a project, writing one of these is a good idea just so you get an idea whether your tests are actually running and what it looks like to have a test success. And then if we come in here and expect true to be false, we should see a failure. So if you're not 100% sure that all of your testing stuff is working correctly with your JavaScript application, just write one of these and just make sure. That way you're not writing tests, getting a bunch of green things and, hey, everything's working. No, it's not. It's horribly broken. There's all sorts of JavaScript testing libraries and frameworks, but I find a lot of them look to be kind of similar, which is kind of nice that they follow this similar kind of pattern. I chose Jasmine for this talk, but I'm not saying Jasmine's better than Mocha or anything. Use whatever you like. And in terms of async tests, because JavaScript executes everything top down and then you have to worry about promises and this whole notion of asynchrony, things get kind of tricky whenever you start doing this pattern. The way it's solved with Jasmine, which I think is a reasonable way to solve it, is they have this little spec done that you can pop into the function that's the callback function for the test itself. You could call this spec done, you can call it Swiss cheese, you can call it whatever. But essentially Jasmine is going to wait until that function is called to say this is, to signal that this is the actual end of your test. And there's like a default timeout, I don't recall what that default is, but if you would never call this, the test would just kind of hang in limbo for a while and then it just, well, it failed after the default timeout. So this kind of enables you to do these sorts of things where I can call Yahoo Finance or not if I had some sort of mocking it out scenario. But it enables me to actually test JavaScript promises but do it in a really simple, elegant way where you're not going way out of your way of going from like beginner to expert level in a single snap of the finger just by virtue of doing this. With this pattern you can check whether the stock symbol is what you expect it to be and you can check that the last trade price is what you expect it to be. Just enables you to have a lot of really cool power. And to be a decimal number here is a custom Jasmine matcher, which is something you're not going to really find in a strongly typed language. So this code here is something I wrote that's completely custom and so if you were writing something like a chess game, maybe it would be that I expect that I'm on the corner of a board or that I'm on row, you know, two or, you know, this sort of cell. You can kind of compose your own language around your tests if you like to get a little bit closer to what your problem set actually is. So this is the code for this custom Jasmine matcher. It's kind of terrifying, honestly, if you glance at it. This is one of these cases where you go to the docu documentation, you look it up, you copy paste it, and you edit this one little tiny line here, and then you change the name of it. Good times. And something else that I find that is a lot easier in JavaScript than it is in other languages where you have to be more methodical and everything's strongly typed. With Jasmine, you can just pave over anything you want and just supply your own implementation of it. 
So what I'm doing here is the fetch button where I was describing before where it has that on method. So on click, do this thing. Well, I'm basically saying, well, I wanna look at everything that happens to that fetch buttons on method. So it is kind of odd that it doesn't do fetch button dot on. There's probably a really good technical reason why they did it the way they did it, but you basically do the last thing that you actually want to spy on, you need to pass it in as a magic string. Something small to remember, but it is what it is. So the spy on the fetch button is cool. So then we can run that big initialization function that basically starts the entire application, but we're not actually starting it in our browser, we're starting it in our automated tests, and whenever the application starts, we expect the fetch button to have been called with click and with this particular parameter here. So that's pretty cool. We're able to check whether something's been called just by virtue of doing this spy on thing here. We didn't have to pull things apart. We didn't have to extract an interface, create an abstract class, or do anything crazy. We just kind of paved over it a little bit and let Jasmine handle a lot of those details. So dry, who knows what dry is? It's, yeah, so dry is don't repeat yourself. What do you think wet means? We enjoy typing. <laughs> yeah. So different people have different viewpoints of drying. Oh, so I will explain real quick. So drying your code basically means that you're not copy pasting the same thing 18 times all over the place. It's kind of this idea that you have one single representation of your conscious thought in one place, that it's not littered all over your application. And honestly, different people have different viewpoints I found in terms of testing how dry they wanna make their test code. Some people have this idea that by drying out your test code too much, that you actually make your tests difficult to understand and reason about, where you know, if you copy pasted that setup initialization code in all of the different places, maybe things are a little bit easier to reason about. And apparently, on the East Coast, it's sundown. Thanks, Flux. Um, so drying out your test code. I blame the sun. Um, yeah, so different people have different ideas of how far you want to take this. I kind of fall on the side of if you're having the, the, the question in your mind of which side you want to fall on. I like drying out my test code more but it's not a reason to like beat up somebody's pull request to you know, take it to the nth degree that you copy pasted this line in three places where it's this constant that could have been extracted to the top of the file. Like, I don't like to go completely crazy with it, but I do like the idea of drying out your test code. So Jasmine enables you to run things before each. So before each one of my tests here, run this big block of code, just ignore that for now. The important point here is I can run all of these different tests with that setup code that was in the before each. So I expect it should get the symbol, I expect it should display loading, it should get price, and it should update price information. I could have taken this entire big block of code and copy pasted it in each one of these, but it kind of muddles things up. So you can kind of go with this pattern. So Jasmine's pretty cool. And one of the other things it does allow you to do is with the spy on, before I was just doing spy on so you could, in the previous slide, just so you could inspect whether the thing was actually called, but you can actually completely pave over its implementation. So get prices normally would call Yahoo Finance. And if you have a bunch of automated tests, you probably don't want to call Yahoo Finance, A, because it's going to take a while and you don't want your test runs to be slow because that's no fun for anyone. And B, if Yahoo Finance is down, your tests are now going to fail. And C, you probably just don't want to be hitting Yahoo Finance. So we can completely pave over the implementation of this because this test isn't really concerned with the get prices method, but it needs to work. So we pave over get prices with our own implementation with this. 
It's a little scary, I'll be honest. So instead of jQuery Ajax, because jQuery Ajax itself returns a deferred object, we return our own deferred object and then we immediately resolve it with what we think would come back. So this is like the parse result from what comes back from Yahoo Finance. Resolve means it was a successful response. We wrap that all in deferred, which that is what jQuery Ajax in and of itself is returning. And then you return a promise of it because you don't want people monkeying with it. So this is kind of the big leap. I'm not gonna, there is some difficulty, honestly, whenever you move from that original slide to this point, like things are going to get a little more difficult. I'm not going to pretend that everything's going to be super easy, but I think it's something to work toward, you know, if you're not here yet. And you know what, you can totally get here. But, you know, this is the way of doing things methodically and modularly and you know, just writing good software and having good practices. And yeah, there's all sorts of ways to modularize. I did that pattern where you have the object, the single object on the global, which in the browser's case is window, but there's all sorts of cool ways. There's ES6 modules, which that seems really cool. I actually started doing this talk in that, but I couldn't find a way to do it without monkeying up too much of the talk. I didn't want to get all of the JavaScript build tools in here because I just wanted this thing to be really simple and I couldn't find a really good way to do it without getting JavaScript build tools involved so I kind of backed off from that but it's totally possible and honestly if you're doing a Greenfield app that might be the way to, to go. ES6 seems pretty cool these days. And I used manual dependency ordering. It is what it is. You need to have things available before you can call them. And there's all sorts of fun code. We'll just glance at some of it. So here's where we started. So we wired up jQuery over HTTP, which you shouldn't do. You should use HTTPS because the man in the middle attacks and et cetera, et cetera. If you really want to get crazy, you can even put the, the SHA of it in there and some of the newer browsers will even do the whole, if somebody tampers with the CDN, it'll knock it down. It's kind of fun stuff, but I digress. So here's the code that we started with, and here's where we ended up. We took all the JavaScript that was there before, and now we have 106 source lines of code where everything is broken down nicely and methodically. So we've got, I believe, three modules in total. We've got the data provider, we've got the UI provider, and then we've got this thing called app, which I used as the kind of the thing that glues those things together. So it has that init method, which was the, the actual starting point in the application, and it has fetch, which did, does all of the work of interacting with the UI, and working with the data provider to get the prices, and whenever the data provider's prices come back, then call the UI provider to set the price. So at the end of the day, I'm not tied down to a lot of the jQuery constructs here. I've replaced it with my own code. And yeah, it does kind of bloat the line count. I'm not going to pretend that you know this is as small a number of lines compared to the other example. But it is simple to kind of understand and reason about what's happening here, that you have the data provider, you have the UI provider, and you have the main starting point. And I have not shown you yet what the test runner looks like, so I should probably do that. Perhaps I should have did that earlier. So let me go to the latest here. So this is all my tests that ran. We got 17 of them and they all run and that's great there's all sorts of different ways to run tests I just chose to use the one that's just built into the browser and just to prove a point we'll break one of the tests just to show you what happens if this is kind of your first endeavor into testing come on 
Adam Editor. So expect true to be false. I don't expect you to read this. Don't worry about it. Uh, and I'm missing ESLint. That's fine. Save it. There we go. So we should see one failure. So when things fail, get the big stack trace. I expected true to be false. If that didn't fail, I'd probably just like throw my laptop on the ground or something. Talk would just be over at that point. Just can't handle it. So does anybody have any questions at this point? I will take the silence as no. Oh, question. Did you use the term greenfield? Yes. Um, so the question was, um, I used the term greenfield. What does that mean? Essentially, greenfield is a new application. The opposite of it is brownfield. So if you were bolting something onto an existing application, usually say, hey, I'm doing brownfield development. But greenfield means you're essentially coming in and you have, you're starting with nothing. You're building everything up from scratch. It's usually where developers want to be because that's where you get to make all of the decisions rather than having all the decisions already kind of made for you on a project. Um, so the question was, was Adam running my specs? No, it was just ESLint, and I don't have the ESLint config in there. So it's just bombing out all over the place, which is totally fine. Yeah, yeah, I got all sorts of errors. It's fun. All right, well, that said, surprise, you just learned a language agnostic skill. So, like, what does that mean? So... If you're more on the beginner end, if you get to this point, you can take the skill to C Sharp, you can take the skill to Java, you can take the skill to Python. Any language, if you know how to do this sort of thing, it's the same thing in every language. You break things apart and you write tests. And if you already know how to do jQuery and JavaScript, this is the familiar lens that you can use to get to that point. And once you're to that point, like moving language to language, like it's easy and pretty awesome. Aside from yeah, learning syntax and blah blah blah, but yeah, and you just look that up on Google anyhow, right? You just go to Stack Overflow, like how do I Ruby? Because I've totally done that whenever I Ruby. <laughs> I was doing a dashboard thing at one point. It was like literally, I knew exactly what I needed to ask Google, but I just don't know the syntax. So you know, here I am, like oh yeah, that's the symbol. Like okay. So, quick recap, draw your code, add tests while you do it, and congratulations, you've reached the next level mm -hmm. of your software development career. So here is the repo associated with it. It's got code up here, it's got the slides. It should automatically tweet it out, which will be pretty fun. Scheduled tweets, I just like discovered that I, you know, should do that today, so that's kind of fun. But any questions, I'm at CandaleIV on Twitter. It's probably the best way to get a hold of me. So with that, I'll just open it up to questions. And I saw there was one there in the back. Yeah. Uh, early on, you showed something that's uh, real time. You put in a, a command on the left and on the right. It showed you what IE, how it would do the same thing in IE9. Uh -huh. What was that? Um, you might not need jQuery.com. Okay. <laughs> Quite literally, you might not need jQuery.com. I wonder what that website's about, anyhow. Weird. So I have a question just kind of, when you were testing certain things that happened in the DOM, for example, that the loading thing up here, mm -hmm. you didn't actually go into the DOM and like peel out the word loading dot 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 and make sure that that was there. You just said, make sure that that thing was called mm -hmm. and assumed that it would do the right thing. Like, how far do you go with that? How do you know that it's just cool to say, hey, it was called, and we'll just trust that? Or yeah, so the question is around this whole notion of how far do you go in terms of testing? How close do you need to get to the metal in order to determine whether your test is actually testing the right thing and like what level of confidence you assign it? And I think it's, I think it's one of those, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Because sometimes if you're writing a test, maybe you feel like you need to actually hit a real database versus other times maybe you don't. I think it's one of those, it's a case-by-case -case thing. 
if you felt like you needed to get to the DOM level here, you could probably do, what is it, document, you could probably create the actual HTML tag in your test and then interact with it that way. Yeah. I figure some of the data binding constructs where you're doing like two-way data binding with like knockout JS or what have you, I figure if you need to test a lot of your custom components around that, you're probably creating the actual HTML stuff, manipulating it with your code and then seeing, you know, has the HTML tag been affected in the way that you thought it should be affected. Right. Well, it's still observable. Yeah, but yeah, I think it just goes to the whole do what you feel, how, get as low as you feel you need to get to be confident that things are going to work. Cool, thanks. Yeah. So would, would something like Selenium or Cucumber be more useful in a DOM, DOM reaction testing? Um, so the question is would Selenium or something similar be useful in a DOM scenario? And basically Selenium, if you aren't familiar with it already, is essentially automating a web browser. So you'd write some code that might bring up Chrome. It might look for some elements to be visible. It'll try to click on them. And with the Chrome driver, it won't even let you click on it if you can't physically click on it as a standard user, which is kind of a powerful feature. But sorry, what was the question? I got off on my own tangent <laughs> of trying to explain Selenium. His question, you know, you're saying, how, would you, how could you know if it actually loaded the loading into the DOM? And what um, is maybe Selenium? Something like that is more appropriate. Yeah, if you, yeah, if you feel that if you'd be more comfortable with testing what the browser actually sees, yeah, you could totally use something like Selenium with browser automation. Perhaps you would have something on the page that you'd be able to get. Maybe there'd be like a special ID, or you'd have some way to get at the element that you want to interrogate, and then you check is that loading text actually there. But it will give you a higher degree of confidence, but when you introduce something like Selenium, it can get a little bit intermittently faily, for lack of a better way to describe that. And it is slow compared to running all of your code in V8 like that. It's gonna be, you're now instrumenting Chrome driver, it's gotta load Chrome, now you have to worry about your back end. Like, but yeah, I mean, if that's what you need for that particular scenario, if you're doing API design and your API is really heavy, maybe you feel that you need to go every single layer with your tests to really feel good about whether they're working or not. But yeah, it's one of those, it depends. Which is a lot of stuff in software development, incidentally. It's a lot of it depends. Well, if there's no other questions, or did you have? No. If there's no other questions, I'll be around, or you can find me at the after party, ping me on Twitter, and this entire repo is open source, so if you have a suggestion for how you'd think you could improve it, I accept pull requests. With that, <laughs> thank you, and have a good rest of the conference.